the more you share, the more creativity you invite. I felt like I was being called to do that. Become an artist in all areas. Started selling my work professionally when I was 15. I started making tons of sales. Good job. So I learned so much myself just by helping others. Welcome back to another episode of the Light Movement Podcast. This is a podcast where we as artists discuss how you can be successful as an artist without selling your soul to the dark art elitist system. My name is Jake Dunn. I'm your host on this journey. And today I'm joined by Dimitra Milan Dunn, my wife and <laughs> professional artist and also art instructor. And what we're going to be talking about today is finding fulfillment through art, through various different avenues. So it's going to be a very interesting discussion. You're going to hear all about why Dimitra decided to start teaching art, even though she had a fully successful career selling her art and all that and a bunch more in this podcast. So stay tuned. It's going to be very interesting. Okay, Dimitra, let's talk about your artist career before mm -hmm. you decided to start teaching. What did your art career look like? And, you know, maybe... For Briefly. the people who are watching who don't know anything about you, like how old are you now and how old were you then? <laughs> I'm 23 now, almost 24. I'll just go through it briefly because it can, it can get kind of long. But I started selling my work professionally when I was 15. And I decided when I was about 13 that I really wanted a career in art. Both my parents are full-time artists. They opened Milan Art Institute and I started just taking all the classes I could. I just fell in love with painting and decided that I wanted to be an artist. It was just working from like 13 to 15 on really honing my skills and focusing on finding my own style and voice as an artist, just having a cohesive look because my paintings were kind of all over the place. And I was still selling them, but, you know, not consistently, not at gallery prices. I wasn't in any galleries. And then... When I was 15, everything really took off. I started working with this publisher in Hawaii. They contacted me. They saw one of my paintings in a newspaper, in the Scottsdale newspaper, when I did a family show. And they just loved the story. They saw an edge with my age being so young. And so, yeah, I worked with a publisher for two years. So when I was 17, I stopped working with them. I felt like we were just going in different directions. They wanted to take me down just a different path. And they really focused heavily on just galleries and selling, you know, through, I guess you call it the elitist system. And they didn't really believe in social media or didn't really see the benefit of selling direct to an audience. And didn't really believe in open edition prints. There was just a lot of things that we just didn't really agree on. And I finally got enough confidence to just go out on my own and yeah, start pursuing my own career and be my own boss, make my own decisions. And I'm really grateful for the whole experience. Yeah. And if you want to watch more or hear more about Dimitra and her experience working with an art publisher, we actually did a whole podcast about that. And you can find that in the link right up here and watch that after this. It was a really big decision for you, though, yeah. to stop working with this publisher. Just briefly, what were you giving up with this publishing deal like what yeah. you you had a lot of success with them you know mm -hmm. it was only two years but in that two-year span could you just give some like a uh, quick highlight reel and like what yeah what was at stake well I grew a lot in the two years when I first came in to that relationship I was 14 and a half just turning 15 and I felt so I mean I knew nothing about the art world and I just had I just learned everything from my parents. I never had my own experiences. So I wanted to take this opportunity to get out in the world, put my art in galleries, of course, make money selling my art. And all I had to do was focus on the painting aspect and they would handle everything else. An all artist's things. dream. Yeah, it really was. After two years, it was a lot of work. I had to paint eight paintings a month. And if I could do more, they wanted more. And every single thing I created they basically had the rights to, couldn't sell anything on the side. When you say rights, not the copyright, but not, the, not the, the copyright. right to distribute. They had the distribution rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to make prints, they decided, you know, which paintings would make prints, which paintings would go where and what galleries. It was a great experience. And what was so exciting, especially at my age, 
was making so much money with my art. And at first I was kind of on an advance. Yeah. Yeah. So they paid me 4,000 a month as an advance until they could start distributing my work. Cause that took time to like make connections with galleries, kind of starting from scratch. And I, after like four or five months, they, they had my work in like 10 different galleries. And then I was starting to actually make more of a profit. And so 4,000 was the least, was like the smallest amount I made during that whole time. And Mm -hmm. I think it went up to maybe eight or 10 at, at the most per month. So I was giving up, you know, like making a good living and not having any expenses, just being a 16 year old, making all this money. It was really nice. Yeah, I was just making 25% off of my originals and the rest went to my publishers and the galleries. So I was really not making so much of the pie. It was like, it was a small percentage. Mm -hmm. And then you were making the least out of everyone. Yeah. And then with prints, I was making 10%. So even, you know, much, much less. Yeah. So as soon as, you know, I went out on my own, I felt like, I feel like when you go in the direction of your destiny and you kind of step into what you're meant to be doing, God or the universe, whatever you really believe in, I believe it's God, just blesses you with money. Like the money comes when you're really doing what you're meant to be doing. And I had my biggest sales yet that year um, going out on my own. And I remember it was just a couple weeks after I you know, told the publishers I wasn't going to work with them anymore. I started painting and I felt so much freedom and just this lightness, like everything just lifted. And I felt so free. I could just paint whatever I wanted. And I did this painting of a girl with golden eagles. And that week, some collectors emailed me and I never met them in person before, but I don't know how they found my work. But they wanted to come for a studio visit and they came and they fell in love with that piece and they just connected with it right away. And that was the first painting I sold and I made, you know, hundred percent profit off mm-hmm. that painting. So it just felt like a sign from God. I was doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. And, and it, then, you said it was of eagles. Yeah. And eagles symbolize freedom too, mm-hmm. you know? So that's just like the ultimate kiss from heaven, yeah. you know, just confirmation. Mm-hmm. So you had this, you know, prosperous career, you gave it up. Well, not necessarily, you gave up the a guaranteed business. paycheck. It was, yeah. it was essentially, you had a job as an artist rather than you got to be your own artist essentially. Yeah. And so yeah. you gave up your job in order to be your own business person. Not to mention I had to give up most of the relationships of those galleries that I was, you know, working with and the publisher had those relationships, but it was a really interesting situation. I mean, of course they were very unhappy about that and the publishers, you know, not working with me and just the ending of that kind of got really messy, but I still maintain relationships with a few of the galleries and we're on really good terms. And I have my paintings still to this day in those galleries. In the galleries that you maintain the relationships, why do you think that those galleries stay like kept working with you as opposed to the ones who did it? They saw the publisher as just a middleman Mm. and they really believe in working with artists. I mean, they valued me more than that's just what it came down to. Their relationship with the publisher. Yeah. Yeah. What's the timeline then between, you know, you starting to work on your own and what sort of success did you have? You know, you had that first initial success, but what did it look like, you know, moving out onto, onto your own? as a self-representing yeah. artist. And then when did you decide to start teaching and why? Okay. So how I moved away from, I feel like this could be a whole podcast in itself, <laughs> moving away from publishing into my you know own career, mm-hmm. but it's still a part of my career. First started with a website. And so the publishing company built my website for me. It was on WordPress, I believe. It was really complicated. I didn't know how to work it. So I started over and I Did they went, own your domain, DimitriMilan.com? No, I oh, did. Thank God. Yes. That yeah. was part of our contract. So good job. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I bought it because it was my name. It's just, yeah. it'd be weird for someone else to own my name. So I had to start over with a website. I rebranded myself, built it exactly, you know, how I wanted it to look. I went through a few different processes with that. I tried different website platforms. I think I started with WordPress, then I went to Squarespace. Now I'm on Shopify because 
it has so much more e-commerce options and I'm currently still on Shopify. So after having a good website, I really focused on social media and took it serious because with the with a publishing company, I wasn't allowed to sell through social media. I couldn't connect directly to my collectors. It was just a way to be a brand, I guess. And so I started putting more emphasis on on social media and took it more serious, treated it like it was a business. And I started making tons of sales through Facebook, Instagram, and then Pinterest. And I started pinning my paintings um, on Pinterest and I would get tons of engagement and people contacting me. And that was really a great place. What's the timeline there? Like what, I guess, like when did you start teaching and then what happened in between? When I first started teaching, that actually happened. I mean, I was doing that while I was learning how to paint. So I had a couple like older women who were too afraid to kind of join a group class. They were, I don't know, a little bit more insecure. They wanted private lessons. And so I taught this one lady for a couple of years, just me and her. And we would work on paintings together. She would have like an idea and she wanted help with it. And I would help her with that. So that really got me kind of out of my shell and helped me teaching other people help solidify my own techniques and really understanding why I do certain things. So much unlocks for a person when you are teaching someone else. And so I learned so much myself just by helping others. And I really loved that. And then I when I think when I was about 14 or 15, I did my first group class and I was so nervous. I was super nervous about public speaking, being on camera, anything like that. I was really shy. I remember talking so quietly in front of the class, like no one could hear me. So everyone was like crowding around. <laughs> and we did these little miniature flower paintings. Everyone did three and it was like this little set that we created. And so that was my first ever art class that I taught. Then it kind of grew from there. I would teach a few more classes. And then when I was about turning 18, that's when my mom started teaching the mastery program on site. And it was really taking off. She was getting so many requests from students. She had to turn people away because she didn't have enough time. And I remember her schedule just getting more and more full. And then she tried to do two mastery programs in one year, but she would do, she had a morning class and a nighttime class. So basically five days a week, she was teaching five, six hours a day. It was a lot of her time dedicated to teaching the mastery program. And I could just tell she was feeling a little bit burned out. And I mean, it was very fulfilling for her. And I came in periodically kind of, I would join some of the classes. I would just kind of observe. I don't know. It was really inspiring to see how these artists would have their whole lives changed going through this program. And I think my favorite part was just seeing people take those, like the first steps and take a first class and realize that they could do this and they would see their skills just take off. And even in just one class, really, they started to believe in themselves. And that was just so inspiring for me. So one day we were driving, my mom was talking about how she just didn't know if she could do it anymore. And it was like, just too much. And so I just, I was like, well, I'll help you teach the mastery program. <laughs> and so, yeah, from that day on, we've just been doing it together. And she still teaches, you know, like the majority of it, like two thirds of the program. But I wanted to contribute more. And at the same time, I was just kind of feeling like I had my career. It was solid. I had some time alone doing my own thing. I had the experience of the publisher. I felt confident in myself to teach other people. I felt like I really did have experiences to share and, you know, just I wanted to share my knowledge and it's, it really has been life-changing and it feels just so fulfilling helping other artists. Having an art career is fulfilling. I felt like there was something missing and I'm not saying you can't be fulfilled as an artist on your own. I think you definitely can. Everyone has their own journey. Everyone has their own destiny. And I just felt, I felt like I was being called to do that. 
If you're enjoying this video and you want to see more content like it, then you're definitely gonna wanna like and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment below. When did you start teaching the mastery program? Almost 18 when I- Oh, you were almost 18. Mm -hmm. Okay, so almost immediately, almost immediately after you stopped working with the publisher, like within- About six, six eight months. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. What were some of the challenges that you faced like when not working with a publisher or was it just kind of all sunshine and rainbows? <laughs> it's hard. I mean, having your own business yeah. and the success you have all depends on how much effort and work you put in. And so that was for me, the challenging part was like, whoa, I have all this freedom now. My time is my own. The amount of money I make is up to me. So the most challenging thing for me was sticking to a schedule and having my own schedule. And the only way I could really do that was setting goals each month and starting with just taking one thing that I wanted to do and then just working towards that. So for example, launching my own prints. I didn't even know where to start with that because the publishers handled that. So I had to find my own print company. And then at the time I was actually, I hired this I don't even know what to call him. He was just assistant, an assistant yeah. kind of. He helped me with, he helped set up my website, some backend things I didn't know how to do. And then he also helped take professional photos of my art so I could do prints. He kind of just helped me with some logistics. So he helped find some print on demand companies. I started with prints and then I got this idea of launching a book with my art. I've always wanted to do that. And that was something that I kept talking with the publishers about, like, coming out with a book and they'd always like kind of put it off. And so that was just something I really wanted to do. And I worked on it for almost a year making my book. And now I want to do a volume two because I've created so much more art since that last book. Mm -hmm. So just having deadlines and goals helped me stay motivated and stick to a schedule. But of course my schedule was my own now and I, I could do whatever I wanted and that in itself can be challenging. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's easier now or harder now for artists to get started as compared to when you got started after working with the publisher? I think it's so much easier because of what's happening online, mm -hmm. how everything's been taken online. And people are so much more comfortable buying art online through your website, through social media. And I think even like, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't not nowhere near as the same level as it is today. Yeah. So I think it's a lot easier for artists to get started for sure. I'd love to dig into why ultimately, like I understand you wanted to help your mom. Mm -hmm. You had some extra time. Yeah. What made you stick with teaching? Like what was it about teaching that gave you that another level of fulfillment that, you know, just selling your art yeah. couldn't offer you? Yeah. Well, it really just, I mean, it was just inspiring to see, how just some knowledge that I had, just sharing my experience. I think some artists feel greedy maybe with their experiences and knowledge and their techniques. Like these are my techniques. Secretive. Secretive, yeah. yeah they don't mm -hmm. want to share that. But the more you share, the more creativity you invite and the more you learn. And it's just, you can never, you'll never run out of creativity. And so I learned that like sharing the techniques that I love and seeing other people fall in love with it kind of turn turn that into their own style. It was just really inspiring. And I really just love seeing like someone start to believe in themselves and see that they can do it too. And just, just see their excitement. That's really why I, I kept teaching and why I'm still teaching to this day. Honestly, you've had quite a few artists like rip you off too. And, you know, go with your style and claim that they are self-taught. Well, and, name any names. <laughs> yeah, not naming any names, but if you would like to name some names in the comments, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> but does that ever like make you hesitant to continue sharing your styles or, or your style or process or, or why no, not? No, it doesn't make me hesitant. I mean, not that it doesn't like bother me at all. When I see artists doing that, it's really only like maybe one or two I, that I can think of mm -hmm. that actually have 
stolen or whatever. I, I still feel very solid in my style. I feel like when you focus on what other people are doing, it's like a lower level of thinking and mm. you just got to focus on what you're doing and realize that no one can actually do what you're doing. Mm. You're the only one and you have to just keep exploring. And as an artist, you're always mm. evolving. So I feel like my art is still evolving. And even this year, just I feel like it's gone to another level since being a mom and I'm painting different, like more abstract subject matter and I'm going to continue to explore and also share what I'm learning. So I think, I don't know, I don't really have this insecurity that someone's going to take what I'm doing and just go do it better. I don't, maybe it's arrogant to think, but I think I, I'll, you know. No one can do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think that is a great mentality to have because the reason why I ask that is there's so many artists, you know, who join our workshops, who yeah. comment on stuff, who ask like, how can I protect myself from others stealing my work, even who aren't teaching, but who are just posting it online. Like artists are actually legitimately afraid to share their work online because they fear that someone else will steal it, post it and claim that it was their own, you know? Well, the copycats out there, it's, they just make themselves look bad. It's mm -hmm. not making you look bad as an artist. And even this is like a separate thing, but having your artwork stolen by, you know, I don't know, companies in China or Russia taking your paintings, turning them into puzzles or cheap, Paint by numbers. horrible prints. I used to get really hung up on that and like just super irritated. I don't think there's stop. I don't think you can stop that from happening. Mm -hmm. It's just going to happen if you're going to put your work online and there's so much technology these days where they can take any image they want, even if you put a watermark, take the yeah. watermark off. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what they can do, like what technology. The well, more, now there's AI too, yeah. which is a whole other discussion of like yeah, AI totally. creating art based off of it being trained off of artists' work without that artist's permission. And then if I just focus on being the best that I can be and try to get more well known and really just stay solid in, in my brand and who I am, people will know the difference of what's a fake and what's real. And I think it'll only make my prints and my originals more valuable. So if you think about all the famous artists out there and there's ripoffs, it's like, I don't, I don't think they care. It's like, so what? It's a ripoff. It's not the real thing. And if you think about like Gucci or uh, Chanel or all those, you know, high-end brands and, in India, they're printing like fake versions of those bags with that print. People know it's it's fake. Yeah. It creates even more demand for the real deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. So you've been teaching now for about six years. You've been a professional artist for eight years. Nine. Nine years. Mm -hmm. How has teaching influenced your creativity or your own art? You said that it helps you solidify your own yeah. style. Like what are some examples of that within your art or ways mm -hmm. that it's helped you grow? So when I was first teaching, I had to really understand my methods. If I'm going to teach someone else, I have to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing and break it up into steps. Here's step one, here's step two. And that helped me just understand my process better. Something magical happens when you are sharing your techniques with someone else. You just get better. You get even better at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm teaching, I'm learning myself. You have to deconstruct what you're doing. Yeah. Like it, it forces you to slow down, to mm -hmm. actually think consciously about yeah. what it is that you're doing unconsciously and yeah. tell another person that. Totally. And by way of doing that, you are giving even more depth and meaning to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because when you're painting, it's like you're in your right brain. I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. And I'm just grabbing certain colors, doing certain things, making drips, making crazy brush strokes. And it's just my habits, but I have to understand why do I do that? Mm -hmm. And so once I do understand that it's, it is pretty cool. It's just fun experience. Yeah. It feels like teaching is a way to be selfish and selfless at the same time. I mean, you hear teachers say it all the time that they get even more out of it than their students get. 
right? Because it's like we said, you know, you're deconstructing. That's like a huge part of actually understanding something fully is breaking it apart into analyzing. And maybe this is like super technical speak, right? But analyzing all the different components, Mm -hmm. the tactics behind the strategy or, you know, all the different components that make up what it is that you're teaching, whether that's oil painting or marketing or, you know, building social media mm-hmm. following or drawing or acrylics or whatever that else is taught is in, yeah. you know, the mastery program. But And I think it goes even deeper than that on a spiritual level. It's, it's an act of giving. It's like a service for others. When you are having a generous heart towards other people and sharing what you know, you're giving back and... We just know as a rule in life, it's it's just a principle. The more you give, the more you receive. Mm-hmm. So I think that's ultimately why teaching is so fulfilling. Totally. I love that. Yeah. The giver always gets the most. Yeah. <laughs> Um, That's why Christmas is so fun. (laughs) You're not excited about what you get. You're excited about what you bought for others. Yeah, I love that. This question might be controversial, not controversial, but like, does it ever get old? You know, you teach a lot of the same things over and over. You know, we do workshops Mm -hmm. on the same topics a lot over time. And, you know, you've had to teach the same things to people in the same positions you know, over time, obviously the mastery program is recorded, so you don't yeah, have to, I don't have to redo like, that. <laughs> yeah. teach that. And on, that's the best way to do it. Mm-hmm. Right. For the live stuff and, you know, the questions that you get as a mentor, mm-hmm. et cetera, does it ever get old teaching the same stuff? Honestly, not really. Hmm. I thought you were going to say, honestly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm so tired of this. I <laughs> no. I'm truthfully, it doesn't get old because every time I am doing a workshop, it's like a new creative process. I'm Mm. starting with a blank canvas. I'm creating a new painting. It's fun for me because I get to paint and I love painting. And then I'm just sharing that and just giving some tips and sharing my techniques. And uh, it's new people every time that are joining the workshop. So it's like seeing more light bulbs go off. I think it is still really fulfilling. You know, the mastery program has grown so much and it's probably taken off more than anyone could have imagined. So many students and, you know, as a result of that, we do more workshops than ever. You know, we spend so much time focusing on teaching in the school and, you know, trying to give to artists as much as possible. How do you balance that with maintaining your own professional career? How do you find time to do both and also be a new mother? (laughs) And this kind of is where it's getting more personal because like even for you as a marketing director, you're still an artist Mm -hmm. and you still want to have time for painting. So it's a balance of when you're passionate about two things and they're both, one really is growing like crazy. It's Mm -hmm. you have to put time in the other. And so the cool thing about our business and being an online artist school and also having an art career, they're synergistic. And the more that I help others and more it's helping my career. And then when I'm working on my own career and, and my artwork, that's giving back to the school. It's just kind of like this synergy that happens. So I just have to have a strict schedule and set aside painting hours, you know, every day. And lately, I mean, the past year or so, it's been really, I would say a lot more challenging being pregnant and having a baby. I mean, it takes a lot of time, but also with the school really growing, that takes a lot of time as well. And so my painting schedule, I feel like we're just now getting to a point and after moving to Florida where I can really- <laughs> And a move. And a no, giant two move. moves. We moved to one house and then yeah. uh, had a baby and then moved to Florida. But and I business. feel like with my new studio, you know, our business has expanded. We're able to hire more people. I feel like we're finally, I'm finally being able to get into this flow of painting again and kind of goes back to the beginning of just setting goals and having these markers in my own business. I have to get those done. So right now I'm working on a series and I have a deadline of when I want to finish this series. So, when you have to, because yes. we're doing an auction. <laughs> yeah. So I have to finish this series and I have to just, you know, say no to certain meetings. That's when you have an online school, there's a lot of meetings. <laughs> I don't know how we do it, honestly. It's a lot to, it's a lot to balance, but yeah. it's a lifestyle. Our work life and being an artist, it's a complete meshing with our day-to-day life. It's like we're not working nine to five. It's like a 24-7 type job. But because it's so fulfilling, 
it's not really draining. So I want to go back to like artists first getting started because, you know, this is in some ways it definitely applies to a lot of artists who have a full time job and who are trying to get started as an artist. But Mm -hmm. in other ways too, you know, it's not quite applicable because like you said, there is a lot of synergy between being an instructor for an art school and Mm -hmm. having like that job and then having your own job as an artist or owning your own art. What advice do you have for someone who is trying to start their own art business on the side who, you know, maybe doesn't have the means to just quit their job and invest fully in that art business? That's a really good question. Well, I would... Be really strict with your schedule and every week, plan your week, know, find the time that you have free and just be disciplined to, instead of watching a movie or hanging out with friends, like work on your paintings and work on your art business. And if you just make that, those small decisions over and over again, eventually they're going to add up to something big and you'll start seeing the fruits of that. And so you have to be really strict with your time and- especially if you have kids. I mean, yeah, it's like, I'm really learning that lately. Yeah, You too. have yeah. to, you got to like use every minute you can and plan your days like meticulously. Mm-hmm. You could also just maybe have a mindset shift and real think in your mind, like your real job is your art business yeah, and your other job is your, what do you call it? Side hustle. Side hustle. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So don't flip those focus on, I think just having that in your mind, it's going to, you're going to start manifesting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great advice too. And I do want to, I want to share like a small little story or anecdote or whatever that I just recently heard on some account on Instagram. It's, it was awesome. So there's this tree that only grows, I believe in Japan, there's this seed that you have to water every day for five years and it stays underground and there's no visible traction that you can see. There's nothing actually happening above Mm. the surface. But then after five years, within weeks, this little seedling sprouts into a 90 foot tree in a matter of weeks after being watered for five years. You know, it's just kind of like, that's sometimes what it takes and, and I think that is why it's so important to find fulfillment in what you're doing, because it's not always easy. It actually, it probably won't ever be easy, right? To, so to get started. And even when you are doing it and, you know, you are running your own successful business and you are living your dream, you just get more difficult challenges once you get there. And I'm not saying that to discourage anyone. I hope that encourages you, but you have to become the type of person who loves challenges, you have to become the type of person who is willing to water a plant every day, even though they might not see it sprout for years to come because so they know that they find fulfillment and purpose just in the act of the watering and the act of the nurturing, you know? And yeah. I think that, you know, a lot of people might look at you in your career and be like, oh, well, what does she know about that? Because she got signed on by a publisher at the age of 15. But what people don't know is that you were watering those seeds since you were five years old painting, you know, you've been painting and yeah, you were blessed in that, you know, your parents were professional artists Mm -hmm. and, but you chose to actually dive into that craft and pursue mastery yourself. And, you know, you had the opportunities and there's so many kids out there who have these privileges or they have these opportunities and they don't grab hold of that. And I think actually that growing up or being in a situation where you have these bottlenecks like money, for example, you don't have enough money can actually force you to be more creative than someone who does have all the money mm-hmm. that they need, you know? And y- you never hear of of great companies or movements that were started by, you know, someone who is super rich and it was easy. They just have the easiest life and, oh, they just decided, except for maybe like Snapchat with, you know, whatever, spiel, whatever <laughs> that guy's name is. But, you know, think of Apple or- They work so hard Yeah, together. like he, they, it was started out of a garage, you know? I mean, there's, of course, you can find case studies on both ends of the spectrums, right? But the most inspiring stories are the stories where people had nothing and chose to work extra hard because they really loved what they were doing and they found fulfillment in it. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that's the goal is to find fulfillment in what you're doing so that you are willing to make sacrifices for it. So really inspiring. And I really love that story you share with a tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just such a good metaphor 
And for artists watching now, I mean, those, the water, like watering your tree or that seed can look like just building your skills and yeah. taking classes, just honing your skills, practicing every day, maybe get a sketchbook and just make a sketch every day. You're going to see yourself grow. And when you look back and you compare what you're doing to what you did a year ago, you'll see the growth. Mm -hmm. And even too, within that, like, you know, just even painting too, like for myself, I don't make the time. I don't prioritize all the time painting, you know, because we know a lot of different reasons, <laughs> yeah. uh, because running a marketing team of, you know, like 10 people and having growing business and scaling that and a baby, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I read it in another book. It was about, you know, the 10,000 hours rule, right? And a lot of people think that it's just time spent doing it, but your 10,000 hours are like time spent in immersed in that world, not necessarily just the act of actually putting paint on the canvas, but consuming art, engaging with artists, being a part of an artist community, thinking about art, like all those things help you work towards your goal. So my advice, you know, to someone starting out would be, of course, find time to paint. Like that's priority number one, because you're not going to build the skill unless you actually like go through the motions and the mechanics of putting paint onto the canvas and drawing something beautiful out of that. But in addition to that, engaging with the community, critiquing other artists. I mean, we built Art Social for artists mm -hmm. and, and you know, sometimes artists complain when they don't get some critique on their post. But the question is, did you critique someone else's post yet? Like you have to go on there and engage with other people yeah. and give, like you said. And if you actually give more than you get, you continuously give to others, you're going to be an artist that gets all the critiques when they need it, you know? And, you reap and if what you, you sow. Yeah, exactly. You reap what you sow. And if you, you know, are consuming art, you're going to galleries and you're just in galleries looking at art and obsessing over the beauty and, you know, uh, taking note of what's selling in these galleries, you know, because you're going there on buying a consistent, your own art yeah collecting, buying yeah. your own art exactly and collecting art and going through that process with other artists and i feel like i notice this almost every time we buy a painting we sell like you know two or three paintings within that same month yeah and so you know it's just this positive feedback loop where you just have to become an artist in all areas and identify as an artist completely and that's why i loved what you said about treating it as your full-time role as opposed to your your side hustle because you know if you are identified as an artist like that is who you are then you're going to be an artist exactly in all areas and you're going to be an artist when you cook you're going to be an artist when you well maybe i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to you're going to do what artists do and that's what artists do is they consume they eat sleep breathe art you know and i think that that's what you have to do if you want to be a full-time artist. And I think a lot of people don't have that belief that they can be a full-time artist, but really the truth is that anyone can do it now. Yeah. You know, all it takes is the persistence. It takes the watering. Okay. So if we were to package this neatly for a conclusion for a video or a podcast, if you're listening to this on podcasting platforms, what would you say is the way for artists to start finding fulfillment in their art? or through their art. I'm just going to go back to what you said about that tree and the seed. Just keep watering your seed and make those small decisions every day and beat that resistance. It's going to it's going to be hard. It's always hardest in the beginning to get started. And then once you get started, you can start to gain momentum and it'll just get easier and easier. And it's going to look different for every person, but make decisions each week fit it into your schedule, make art a part of your life and whatever your dreams are. I mean, if you want to start teaching art, if you want to be a full-time artist, just start making those small decisions in the direction of your destiny. Well, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your wisdom. And if you want to learn from Dimitra or her mentor, her mother, or her father, or all of them together <laughs> in a one-year program 
where you get all the insights that they have from painting to oil painting to drawing to acrylics, mixed media, inks, all the different skills that you could possibly want to acquire within visual arts and also find your own voice as an artist and build a career out of that, whether that's through galleries or through social media or you know self-representing, then check out the Mastery Program. It is a comprehensive program for artists that is shattering the curse of the starving artist. It'll help you go from A to Z, from absolute beginner to professional artist in just one year if you're willing to put in the work and the effort. And of course, it's a lifelong journey, but we hope that you choose to start that journey with us. So click the link in the description or at the end of this video. We hope to see you there. And if you're not yet ready, then check out this video.